What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. to tell podcast episode 158 dexter henry brian fonseca here Cute. and we have a special guest uh one of my favorite hip-hop producers finally glad to get him on the show static selector static what's what up, up man how y'all feeling yo we're good we're good man how oh, you doing wow. i'm good man i'm good we're doing construction over here we're hanging uh bear bricks in the crib oh wow okay all right cool got a little construction go- going on there all right, man, we, we got to get into it because you got the new album out, um, that The Balancing Act. Uh, Brian and I, we talked about it in the last podcast. We really are digging it. Yeah. We saw, you know, you saw our comments. You retweeted us. We appreciate that. Um, just talk, You have worked on these compilation projects uh, for quite some time. But talk to way me about... Long. Way too long, right? <laughs> talk to me about this one and, and the, the mindset behind it, the theme, and how it all came about. Yeah, I mean, I came up with the title way before... Uh way before this madness of 2020, but the cover and all that too. And um, it's crazy that everything's got amplified and it ended up going from my personal balancing act to the whole world's balancing act that this year has been. So I think it connected with people in a certain way that, that, you know, there's a silver lining in there for me. So everybody's going through it right now one way or another, but the balancing act of 2020 was really just, you know, sticking to sticking to, finding new ways to get money, sticking to ways to find time with your family and appreciate life. And, you know, this year is just a different, um, it's a different mood. So would you say, would you say static that a bunch of that was recorded, I guess, like as all this is going on, like maybe in the second half of 2020 and things start to escalate just, you know, with the pandemic, with social justice, with everything that people are fighting for. And, you know, all of that tying into that, would you say that most of it was done in that time? Yeah, like, no, half of it. I'd say half and half. Like, half the album was done kind of um, before. I wouldn't say half. Like, a chunk of the album was done before the, the pandemic. And then, um, you know, I had to finish it up. Finishing it up was really a challenge because mm. a lot of people, even the cats that got studios in their house, like, a lot of people weren't really trying to record this year the way I thought they were going to. After the, During the pandemic, I was like, oh, maybe people will be at home just recording. And, like, you'd be surprised how many artists weren't doing that. So, mm. So certain things happened that weren't supposed to happen and certain things happened that that um certain things didn't happen. It's just like there's a lot of moments on the album that I think wouldn't have happened if we weren't going through this. Is it when you talk about that title, the balancing act stat, what is it also sort of balancing the game and, and, and sound? Because when we think of mainstream hip hop, there's kind of a, a sound that's prevalent out there uh right now and you've kind of been more in that the boom bap uh, classic style uh, of the sound of production. Is, is this more of the balance you sort of wanted to bring to the game with this project? Um, I never really thought about it like that, but I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I was think I was thinking about it more like as far as life, like you know, balancing um, being a dad and being a, with my daughter, and then going and doing you know, going to the studio and going to clubs and being on tour and coming home and balancing that out because. You know, that's what I was doing a lot. Like, I literally was half half the week. I was with my kid. Still still right now. Now it's even different as a single dad because now it's like when I'm with my kid half the week, it's like, that's it. There's no, none of the fuckery is going on. And then right. the other, other three, four days is like, that's when I go to the studio. That's when I, you know, do the parties. That's when I do all that. But when, when I first started, it was more about just being with her every day and going, you know, she goes to sleep. I go to the studio. I go to the club and I come home and it's... There was a whole balance in that. And now it's a whole, that was before the pandemic. Now the balancing act is like so much, like dealing with homeschooling. And I know all the parents out there can feel me on that. So I feel really you on that. I know it. <laughs> he got a daughter. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah, no. I feel you. It's, it's, it's a tough time, a tough time dealing with all that. So, how, so with that, with that being said, Stat, do you find yourself maybe being more inspired creatively uh, with, with, with the process of this and just having to do all that? Has it inspired you more? I wish I could say yes to that, but not really. Mm. Like I've been, I've been, I'm gonna tell you this: when I turned the album in, I was like, "Thank God!" Like it was like the biggest relief. 
ever of any album because it was it was a it was a challenge to finish it up like we're just in um weird times but you know what i love the way it came out everybody's been giving me amazing feedback so i think it, it, it happened the way it was supposed to man it was like divine intervention the way the album wrapped up yeah and we we also wanted to thank you for finally putting Nas and joey badass on a song together because that's something that we've been looking forward to as as hip-hop fans and especially as new york hip-hop fans and new yorkers for a long time yeah that, that actually was like the first decision i made for the album um back in january we met up you know uh joey had never met Nas, and, wow. and I, I, mm. to, I went to meet up with Nas and um in la grammy weekend and I told him, I, I texted Joey, he's like, yo, I don't feel good, I'm not trying to go out. I was like, nah, bro, come, <laughs> like, come to this meeting. So he pulled up and we chopped it up. And I had to be so clear when they met. I was like, this record is for my album. Because, you know, <laughs> Joey's working on his album, I was working on his. I was like, this is my single, let's go. <laughs> that was a big part of, uh, you know, full circle for me, too. Because I've been working with Nas now for, man, I yeah. did a mix with him in 2006. Prophecy. And here we are 14 years later. Yeah. So, you know, and obviously Joey's my little brother. Like, putting that together was very important for me because I wanted to see that happen. What, what's the process generally when you do these compilation albums that, in terms of the artists you want? Obviously, you've got the artists you've worked with a lot, like you said, like like a Joey, sometimes Action Bronson, some other guys you've worked with. What, what In this album in particular, what was it, the process in terms of you choosing the artists you wanted for the production that you had? It's, it's always different processes. Um, with this album, Joey actually set off the whole album because we were in we were in the Bahamas working on his album at this crazy studio. <laughs> we stayed like nine days working on Joey's album, and me, Chuck Strangers, Powers, we all had like our own rooms in the studio, and I was just making beats the whole time. And that joint, um, "Watch Me" on the album was like the first song I did for my album. But I, when I made it, Joey was like, "I want that for something I'm working on." And I was like, "Nah." I was like, <laughs> "The next morning, was, we're, we're sitting there having breakfast the next morning," and I'm like, "Bro." <laughs> not trying to stress this but i was like i need that record i was like i play it first first song on my radio show every week blah 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 i was like i need that record and he thought about it he was like all right man and i was like he's like Do, you know the rest of this trip's my records i'm like i get it i get it but i was like i need that <laughs> he gave me the green light and that was the moment like something clicked in my head and it was like i started my album so so watch that me Record. So that's my favorite song on the album. I love that joint, man. It's, it's, it's such a good vibe. And then one of my other favorite songs this year is a song you produced uh, for Joey, The Sh Shine. Because um, yeah, I, yeah. I love what I love what you did with the Roy Air sample, man. That's one of my favorite songs overall, and I just I love it, man. Uh, with Joey, how, his album, I know he's still working on it. How close is he to being done with it, and how much how much can you have done on the album? He's been done like 10 times. <laughs> uh, I don't even know how many joints I got on the album at this point because he's he's uh he's gone through so many different transitions with this album and I'm I'm really excited for people to hear it, but I definitely have a couple. Okay, all right, good, good, yeah. to, good to hear that. Probably yeah. more than a couple. I just know you know a couple of secured. Nice. I mean that's good. I think the last time we uh, Dex and I were talking about this, uh, he said that he. He would sign for right now a, a, a little, even if it's just a four or five pack with Static Selecta and Joey Badass. But oh, yeah. well, that, I know we, we did the three pack. I did two of those, and then last, uh, what a couple of years ago, we did a three pack too. But we've done a couple of those. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever think you guys will do like a full album together? Because you've worked with a bunch of other artists. Just you and you and uh, you and Joey, or do you think that'll happen? We already got it, man. I, I'd say that. I mean, I'm not. Hold on. Don't quote me saying that it's coming out. I won't. We have. Probably have like thirty songs, forty songs that are incredible, and then like just sitting there. So, me and Joey, like, we have a different kind of work ethic. He comes through; he'll come through for an hour. We'll knock out three. Like, he's um, we just we've always been on a different, uh, just a different wave than other artists when they come through the studio. Me and Joey got man, mm. albums with an S full of material. Mm. That's good to hear because that's something we definitely look forward to. Static, I wanted to I wanted to mention this because this is something I always wanted to ask. Uh, if you see in my background, this is from uh, GTA Four, uh, right. which you were on the soundtrack of. You did. Um, I was the DJ. I, I, yeah. I host the whole channel. Yeah, yeah that's it, right. It was you and Funk Master Flex. What was that experience like? Just kind of uh, earlier, I guess, in your career, and you know what that did for you? Because for me, that was what made me a fan because you had the songs with Saigon and Freeway and there were some of my favorite songs in that game. 
that's dope. Um, yeah, it was a challenge for me too because at that point in life, I didn't even know how to make uh, sample free music, and we had to make it sample free for the game. So that was a challenge for me. And um, shout out to Rockstar Games. They're so hip hop over there. Last Work. week, I, was, I went out with my daughter, and we were we sat down at this restaurant, and all of a sudden, I looked next to me, and it was my man Yvonne and everybody from Rockstar who who made that happen for me back in, uh, what was that, 2009? Long yeah. Time. And um, they're just a good, the whole staff up there is hip-hop heads. So when they asked me to do that, I was like, what? And, you know, amazing opportunity. So hopefully I need more video game stuff. I love doing that. Um, <laughs> doing that doing that project was cool because they basically gave me, um, they gave me the creative freedom to do whatever I wanted as long as it was sample free and just make it sound like New York. And it just it came out dope. Shout out to Consequence, Quali. Um, that EP's on iTunes too. They let me put it out on iTunes too. That was really cool. So mm. that's dope. I, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know it was out. Yeah, on Sky Zoo, Sky Zoo Index, Sky Zoo, uh, who we've actually had on this show, I think three times already. Yeah, three times. Sky Zoo is actually he's got to join in that game as well. Yeah, yeah. I produced that one too. Yeah. yeah. Stat, uh, Stat, I wanted to just take it back for you. Your inspirations, um, and how you produce. Who, who, who are your inspirations musically in terms of your hip hop production and and who do you still take inspiration from today? I mean, I think everybody knows the answer to that. That's Primo. Yeah. Q tip. Um I wanna I wanna talk about some cats I never really uh mentioned in interviews. Sure. Jake One, I love Jake One, big influence on me. Yep. Um mm. Ill Mind, uh man. Uh Clark Kent. Clark Kent. Yes, legend. Like, like you know, it's, when you hear my music, it's obvious who influenced me, but obviously, you know, Primo's number one. Um, Dr. Dre, obviously. Um, but some of the newer cats, I'm trying to think of who really pushes the uh, the envelope for me. Um, man, shot the short fuse, my man. Short fuse, all right. Yeah, he's from Lawrence, where me and Term are from. Uh, shout out to. Uh, Man. We didn't mean to put you on the spot like that, man. <laughs> nah, no, no. I mean, yo, my, my big brother, literally, like my brother Alchemist, like the way he's yes. so consistent so many years later. Like, I, you know, a lot of people don't know how much time I spend at Alchemist's crib. Like, I had an apartment in LA for two years, and I spent more time at Alchemist's crib than I did at my own apartment. Like, I've been watching Al for a long time and doing, and like, we, we have a lot of unreleased beats we did together, too. We're going to do a project at some point. So shout out to Alchemist, man. Oh, that's so I, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I was literally watching Fuck That Fuck That's Delicious last night, uh, where Alchemist was running around with Action Bronson. I think they were yeah. in Italy, actually. I'm wondering, like, Should've what? Been on that show, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> I was actually, we'd love so to see I, you on there. I, yeah, that would have been great. I was actually gonna ask you, like, what's your best? Because given that you spent a lot of time with Alchemist, what's your best Alchemist story? <laughs> Funniest. Ah, uh, man. <laughs> a good one is we were in Munich, Germany, and we were leaving the spot. It was me, uh, happy birthday, my man Sammy Needles. Um, it was me, Sammy, Alchemist, and Twin from Mob Deep. And we were leaving the club, and there was a couple fans who were way too uh, aggressive. You know, a lot of the European fans are mad aggressive. <laughs> we were getting in the van, and I remember we, like, the dude was wilding out, like, trying to get a picture or something, but he was going too hard. And Twin shut the door on his fucking face. The show was crazy. Damn. And we we almost got in a crazy brawl that night, but it was it was um a f we were all laughing our asses off in the car. But the way Twin shut the door on this dude's face, like his face must have been an inch away from us. <laughs> <laughs> like bang. We, we, we laughed about that for a long time. But anyway, I, I mean I got a hundred out of the stories. I'm I'm the, the rap camp days were fun. We used to do this thing called rap camp at his crib. And like it would be Gibbs, action. Term, uh, Planet Asia. Mm. Uh, so many twin was always there. Like we just have like two or three rooms going with beats, and then people were just recording. It was crazy, and uh, some of the songs came out of that were, were bananas. So the rap camp mm. days were fun. You know what? Kendrick, Kendrick was there. Schoolboy Q. Oh, like man. it was the early days for all Mac Miller. Rest in peace. Yeah, it was crazy, man. When I look back at that that, that time, like 2010, 11. We had these dudes around just chilling, and like they all became stars, man. Beautiful time. 
That's what? crazy. I know you. I know you have a really good Freddie Gibbs story, also. I know you have to have a really good Freddie. I can't Gibbs tell story. a lot of them. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. That's got to be. That's got to be crazy. Um, when in terms of with, with some of this, uh, no, I wouldn't say the same. But uh, we used to mess with chicks that were like best friends with other chicks, and some of the nights <laughs> went down were woo. I'm sure. I'm sure. They, I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were. Some are always looking for more sports content, and among the glut of sports media, some are looking for sports content that dives a bit deeper and doesn't just stick to sports. So check out Backpack Broadcasting's original long-form sports journalism series, Sideline Stories. The award-winning original series takes viewers directly into underrepresented communities within the world of sports. It's a series that goes beyond traditional sports reporting, like box scores and statistics, presenting exclusive stories that you won't find anywhere else. With a diverse group of correspondents, the series provides interviews and interesting stories around the world of sports, because there is so much beyond the game, and so much that occurs off the field or court that impacts each of us and the world we live in. Giving a voice to athletes, coaches, fans, and everyone involved in athletics, Sideline Stories looks to push sports storytelling further than ever before. It's a winner of the 2020 Independent Shorts Awards, and all episodes of Sideline Stories are available for viewing today on Backpack Broadcasting's YouTube channel and Facebook page. What was it like working with Mass Appeal for this for this project? Um, could you sign on with them earlier this year? It's been really cool, man. The fact that I'm signed to Rock Nation and Mass Appeal at the same time is bugged out. And um, the, the, both teams came together and, like, we do weekly conference calls and all that. And it's just really cool seeing them work together and seeing who brings what to the table with different things. And, um, you know, it's been a good experience. Mo, Brian and I were talking about this, and Brian even tweeted about this. A lot of people, you know, the compilation album is, is I don't yeah. want to say dead, but there's not a lot of people doing it or doing it on the level that you do it, Stat. Um do you think that this is something we'll see producers do more or younger producers being inspired to do more? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this humbly and, and um, just honestly, I don't think anyone can do it the way that I do it because the relationships I have with all these dudes, like if you see someone else come up with a track list like that in the next couple of years, you let me know and I'll be I'll be blown away. But <laughs> it's not possible, man. It's just the, the relationships I have. Obviously, someone like Khaled does it way bigger and crazier with hits, but I'm talking about on a raw hip hop level, right? Can pull it off. Man. That's it. Not right. without, not without a million dollar budget. And guess what? I don't pay any of them because it's out of respect and it's off trades. I've never paid a rapper in my life. It's always been mm. just a mutual respect or I or a trade. Like I, they know I got them, whether it's on the radio or whether it's on their own albums. Like someone asked me last week, like, "Yo, who's the budget? Your your track list is crazy, bro." <laughs> if I had to hire all those artists. I'd be like five million dollars, <laughs> right? Right. Nas versus and, and Jack Harlow and and you know, come on, man. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know what Joey Badass charges for a verse? <laughs> no, actually, I, we do, we don't. But I know it's a lot. I don't want to throw it out there, but it's uh, it's 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 a brand new uh, you know, Benz wagon. Uh, <laughs> That's I got I got a good I got a good idea of of what that it was in now. Now you've done these compilations. Do you prefer doing the compilations or just locking in with one artist? Like I love working with one artist, and I love working on just a, a solo thing. These compilations are actually excruciating to pull off, so I'm I'm done for a little while. I'll probably do the ten, I have to do a tenth album. It's you can't end at nine. But um, in the meantime, I'm working on a lot of projects. Me and Two Chains are finally dropping. Um, me and um. Me and Black Dot are working on one. Yo, you you made me really oh. ha- you made me really happy, Stat, because I've been saying for a while I was hoping that Black Thought would do one of his streams of thoughts with you, and I was yeah. hoping that. So you and Black that is coming. So that joint, the first song on the album, yeah, we had a very uh, a very we had a standoff about that song. Like he he did not want to let me use it on my album. He wanted it for, <laughs> and I was like, bro. And listen to the way it goes into the second song. And he was like, well, since you got it all figured out, just know that you won't. He's like, you owe me four or five lifetimes of favors. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> but um, now nah, we had like a standoff on that record. But I love Black Dog, man. He, I honestly, I told him, I'm like, I, I don't think there's a human being alive that can do what he does, man. Black Dog is one of a kind. He's 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 one of one of the illest ever. So is, you said you got the you said you got the project with Two Chains and th- Eddie. Can you tell us when those might be coming? Uh, when we might be able to see some of those? I mean, I'm gonna put the energy out there. 2021, definitely. That Two Chains album has gone through so many changes. 
mm. and we're still we're still going. Every like every month or two, he sends me a new record. But we're we got enough for two albums at this point. Mm. Oh, that, that's another thing too that I wanted to mention about the track list because like. Yes, it's a lot of, uh, I guess, rapidy rap, as some people would label it. But there's a lot of range there because you have Betty the Butcher and Jack Harlow and 2 Chains and Paul Wall and Terminology and Nas and Joey Badass on the same project. And to your point, I don't think people can pull that off at all. <laughs> yeah. They cannot do it. I like it's, that it's confidence. A, no, it's not confidence. It's just like it's, I got my own lane with that. And it's like the only person I can see pulling something like that off it's Primo, and I know he's working on his own album. He's mm. been saying it for 20,000 years, but I'm, I'm excited to hear what Prem does because I, I know some of the records Prem got done for his own album. I don't even know if I'm supposed to talk about that. But, yo, <laughs> it, it, he's the only person I can see pulling off. Even, like, Al. Like, Al does his compilations, but it's usually, like, one person, two people on a song. It's right. not, you know, nobody's putting Killer Mike 2 Chains and Conway on a record. Right. That was nuts. When right. I saw that, I was like, "What does this sound like?" And yeah. also, one of my one of my sort of, I guess, underrated would be uh, maybe a stretch, but I just don't see a lot of people talking about it. I really like the joint with Dave East and Method Man, and I felt like yeah, they had pretty good chemistry about to do on a that. Video for that man. Oh, what? Like, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Dave East, man. I actually said Dave. East. Me and Dave working on something too, but shout out to Method Man. We're working on something too. Method Man gets better with time, bro. Yo. I've been saying that. Lemon Squeeze verse. Lemon Squeeze verse this year. He killed that. His verse is, is his wordplay has been just more Yo, intricate. You know he swear? He hasn't sworn in like 10 years. Yeah. He hasn't. He hasn't. Even when he go, even when he hops on people's shows for freestyles, no, he no doesn't cussing. swear. And it's crazy because Method Man was a dirty mouth motherfucker back then. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, he was. Where? Stat, are there any artists that you haven't worked with that you're like, yo, I want to get this person in. I want to get him in the booth with me. I bet you know the answer to that. Yeah, I would say, is it Jay? Yeah. Yeah, see, I mean, I figured. Because you okay. know why? You know why, Stat? Because I'm a fan of your music. I'm a big Jay fan. I always was like, I want to see a Stat and Jay track. So what's so I'm so going to tell you the story about Jay real quick, man. Okay. So it's Grammy weekend this year, and Kobe Bryant passed away, man. Like, yeah. So I seen... I seen Jay at the Rock Brunch on Saturday. Sunday morning, wake up to the um, the news about Kobe, and everybody was super fucked up. Like the whole city of LA was just quiet. And um, I went to the Rock office, and I I was in the middle of a meeting with a with an agency. And um, I, I I don't know if you, I'm managed by Rock Nation for everybody that doesn't know, but I went to the bathroom and I come back, and Jay's just standing there, and he's like. What's up, man? I'm like, what's up? And I had so much I wanted to talk to him about, but he's just like, what's going on? I was like, you know, in this meeting, I was like, I, you know, I literally had, I was speechless because of what was going on. And that was like the vibe in the office. But there's so many things I want to talk. Like, I had literally things on the top, like a list of things I wanted to mention to him real quick. And it was like the, the energy was just so whack because Kobe passed that, like, I was like, I'll see you later. He's like, where are you? He's like, see you. And it was just like a bad, it was just such a sad moment in time, man. Like, yeah. Because Jay had hit up um, Bun B when we were doing Trill Static. Yeah. And he was like, yo, I always wanted to do a project like that live. And mm. that was like the first thing I was going to say because that's another thing that like I own, bro. Like, I don't think anyone can pull off those live albums the way I've been doing them. I did one with Freddie Gibbs, Freeway, yep. Bun yeah. B, Term. Like, that's a brand that I want to expand and in just 2020 fuck that shit up. So, Hopefully, when we get um, back in a normal, I don't think we'll ever be normal again, but when we get back into a world that we can just do what we got to do, um, I want to do more live albums, too. I got a couple of ideas for that. So, But yeah, man, the J conversation's always been like very close to, to, um, very close to happening as far as like us getting on something. But, you know, hopefully, there's a couple of things that he might even be on already. I'm just hoping it happens soon, you know? Man, I'm hoping. I'm really hoping it happens because, yeah, like you said, when you said you know who it is, I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I, I, I know exactly um, who, who it is, and 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 Jay who... Kendrick. Uh, there's not many other people, man. Uh, yeah, Kendrick will be dope too. Yeah, I'm three thousand, but I know that he's not even. He don't even do nothing anymore, so I don't even know. Yeah, we 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 need we need we need three stacks. So we need three stacks to do to do something. So so what so is that just what's next for you, Stat? In terms, of you just kind of gonna be working with people before we get to the tenth 
compilation album is just kind of going to be you working with some artists. Yeah, I'm about, to, I'm about to drop an R&B album, bro. Highly Supreme, man. The kid's incredible. He's all oh. in my album. Yeah. Oh, and he was yeah, on he's a lot of hooks. Wise album. Yeah. Right? He's been on a lot of albums, but um, we're about to finally do his project. And it's it's like D'Angelo meets Bob Marley meets uh, Nirvana. Let's go. Ooh, oh, I like I, I like I like the mix of that. How how much are you talked about the normal stat? How much are you looking forward to just being able to collect connect more in person with artists, right? Because you have to do a lot of this stuff remotely, even like we're doing this interview. Just how much are you yeah, looking forward to that? I, I don't work with cats that I don't vibe with though. Like so everybody that's ever been on one of my albums, like is someone I'm I consider a friend or like someone I can hang out with. Like I don't like working with people I don't vibe with. So it's like it's beyond that, you know. Yeah, no, totally, yeah. totally understood, totally understood with that. All right, Stat, yeah. um, you got anything else, Brian? Yeah, uh, just wanted to ask you real quick. Uh, terminology. I'm, sh- I'm yeah. sure you guys have something coming up also. When, because we, we, you know, we're terminology fans up here also, and you know, I'm Puerto Rican just like him, so I've been following him for a long ass time. So, what, what else did you guys have coming up? I mean. Term takes up uh, space in my life, so there's always me. <laughs> That's my brother. We always we have a million, gazillion, trillion songs that are coming up. Nice. Term, Term literally has the studio next to mine. It, like, it's he. It, I probably have a thousand songs that aren't out yet with Term. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> and, and I guess the last thing for me, Stat. Um, I think people listen to your sound and say you're sort of keeping that that hardcore Northeast New York sound alive. Um, yeah. What, what do you, what do you think about that? Some people will say that sound is dead. What, what, what do you say? What do you say to that as a producer? They're fucking morons. If you look at <laughs> the, look at the Grammy nominations, bro. It's like, you got, you got Alchemist. First of all, I know Alchemist from the West coast, but right. that's East coast rap. Sound, right. You got, you got, you got Alchemist, Royce of five nine, Royce is from Detroit. He makes East coast rap. Um, Look Nas at uh, hit boy. Nas. Look at Nas. For I hope Nas wins because he deserves it because he's been yep. been ripped off by the Grammy so many times. Facts. Um, how can you even like look at Griselda's run right now? Like, yep. By the way, let me be completely clear. A lot of these, a lot of these careers started in my studio. That's a fact. Griselda, Freddie Gibbs, Joey, Action, Mac Miller, rest in peace. Um, all the all this shit came from my lab. So I'm proud of everybody. Yeah, that's nah, true. That's that, true because the Freddie Gibbs EP, Lord Giveth, Lord Taketh Away, I think that was 2011, and that was like, it. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you and hosted that. that. And then I put tw- a song on there, then I did, you know, me and Gibbs did a whole album in 2000, uh, I believe 10 or 11, one of those. Yeah. 11. You, and obviously, you have a, you know, you were huge in jo- Joey's, you know, take off. I remember seeing you spin it for him, and I went to a couple shows. I think that was in 2012 or 2013, you know, early yeah. on. It, 400 shows together. That's like, crazy. That's crazy. Because I've seen you guys a couple of times, and I saw you spent for him, and so it's just been crazy the work you've done with him and and, and found found him. Do you like you like where Joey is is going as an artist? Because I feel like he's growing so much and he's really pushing what he's trying to do. I love it. That kid has never ever disappointed me as far as musically. Like I've seen certain artists come out, and um, there's like a certain talk I have with artists when they come out, and and I believe in them to a certain level, mm. and. I had it with Mac Miller. I had it with Joey. I've had it with Chance the Rapper. I had it with a couple of people, and some of them let me down a little bit. But Joey never, ever. He always sticks to the. I don't think the 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 fans in the world understands what Joey's a product of. Like, this kid grew up in the '90s in Brooklyn, and his mother was like playing Smith and Wesson when he was like in, in the baby. Like, th- this dude was, you know, listening to Biggie and. And Nas, when he was one year old, like he was yeah. born into it. It's a different kind of hip hop that's in Joey's blood. So he's really a product of this shit. Yeah, man, I'm I'm really excited for his album. I'm really excited to see what what you do uh, next. That um, yo, same. We we thank you for the time. Um, we love what you're doing musically. We love what you're doing with all these artists. So yep. yo, please, 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 we we are begging you to keep up the great work. Um, yes. Keep up the great work with the artists. Uh, my brother, yeah. hopefully we uh we're able to see you in Lincoln person uh sometime again soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Love is love, man. I appreciate y'all. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mind got some interesting things this week. Uh Brian's gonna be talking about something in the world of sports broadcasting. And I'm gonna be talking about something around a story where somebody had to stay ready 
but I like how a young woman is using her platform to promote herself and also help others. More on that later. Brian, what you got? Dan Levitard is leaving ESPN. Mutually agreed upon, apparently. Uh, found out yesterday or earlier this morning that he's also keeping the show back catalog, which I found very interesting. And I'm wondering, like, how does ESPN agree to give that up? But I saw that reported on Twitter, so that's something I want to I investigate more. So, uh, And I got to go back and listen to the rest of the show. A lot of people don't I, get that opportunity. Yeah. And, that, you know, look, it also factors into why I said he doesn't really need ESPN. But the way, but but it just and just getting to it, right? Uh, Dan Lebetard apparently just had enough, I guess, of being there for for lack of a better way of saying it. I think that you know, as somebody who watches the show uh, and has done so religiously for several years now, when I really think about it, um, it's the show that I've listened to the most by far, probably in the last seven years since they went national on ESPN. And even a little bit before that is when I started listening to them more, even when they were still based in Miami, because I was just a Dan Levitar fan. And I realized like, that's one of the shows that you just start listening to and then you can't stop. You know what I mean? It's just one of those. And I like, I've known for a while because he said so on the show, like he's been suspended from ESPN over some bullshit. So like, you know, he's he's wanted to challenge the company. You know, why don't we cover ourselves the way we cover other people, us being ESPN? You know, why can't we talk about stuff that's going on politically, which we know that Dan's always at the forefront of in, this, in the company in a way like Jamel Hill uh, wanted to be as well at one point and then left so that she could do that and pursue those opportunities, which she's done on Spotify and Vice and everywhere else. Uh, I think Dan Levitar might end up taking a similar path to where it's like, maybe I could do my writing here. I could operate the business of Levitard and Friends or whatever the network is going to be called there. Like, There's just so many layers to this that we can get into. And we probably will when he when that actually, you know, when the time actually comes, because he has until January 4th. Um, Stu Goss is going with him. I think the entire show is going with him. Uh, ESPN wants to go in a different direction in terms of their programming, it's looked like because they've wanted to just sort of give us more Mike Greenberg and, you know, more sports, you know, they are sports network at the end of the day. And I think that as you see Jamel Hill leave, you see Michael Smith leave because we can't really forget about Michael Smith's contributions there as well. Mm -hmm. You see Dan Levitar leave, you see a lot of other people leave and go out and do these other things. Um, how much it's reasonable to ask how much longer are certain other people who shall remain nameless going to be there because of the route that ESPN is going, uh, which is different under Jimmy Pitaro than it was uh, previously uh, under John Skipper. So with Dan, it's just like it's very significant. I'm curious to see what he does. I expect it to be, you know, maybe and this would excite me. Maybe he does something independently. Maybe he does something where he takes something like the Levitard and Friends Network that he was doing at ESPN, which housed podcasts from Marty Smith, Mina Kimes, Levitard himself, Stu Gatz, The Shipping Container, um, Sarah Spain. And then, you know, maybe he does something similar, though he can't use all of them, I suppose, because of their ESPN deals, but maybe he does something similar outside of that. Like, maybe he goes and grabs Jamel Hill. Maybe he gets Jamel Hill and Michael Smith. I don't know. Or maybe he just gets some other people that he just wants to put on along with, you know, him and the entire show. But whatever it is, I'm obviously going to be paying very close attention because look, that could open some things up, not directly for me, I'm saying, but open things up just for another pool of people. Because if you notice, like the people that he's always aligned himself with and looked out for and worked with, like uh, Bomani Jones credits him for really kickstarting his broadcasting career and really putting him on. They actually told a story on the podcast about how Bom Bomani Jones was going to go to Fox and Dan Lebatar was like, no, you're doing highly questionable with me. You know what I mean? It's actually a really funny story. Uh, and I was glad that they actually got to tell that because that was something I hadn't heard previously. Um, and I can't really imagine Bomani Jones on Fox either. But basically, like, you know, with with uh, Katie Nolan and 
you know, b being the first person that I saw putting L. Duncan on highly questionable, the first person that I saw putting L. L. Duncan in a position where she gets to give her opinion instead of just report the news. You know what I mean? And now we see her like on Bomani's podcast, et cetera, et cetera. Like he's done this with a lot of people, Sarah Spain and Mina Kimes and empowered so many different people. So I think he's just going to bring that energy to wherever he is. And it's going to be fun because like we're in a business where there's, there's not just one way to get to there's there's not just one place to go to. You don't have to just go to ESPN. And that's the main thing that I take away in all this. Like he's one of the people who doesn't really need ESPN, though they did obviously help him a lot. He was able to take advantage of that. But now going forward, like this is a man who's really been a man of the people. And that's evident by having to show at Gramercy Theater last year that I went to where 500 tickets sold out in 30 seconds and all the people showed up uh, and like Stephen A. Smith and all those other people I mentioned. So, you know, shout out to Dan. Oh, and I'm going to be looking forward to whatever's next. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to what he does next. Uh, Dan is such a huge voice to all minorities, specifically the Latino community, because uh, we don't have too many of them at the forefront of sports, because often many times, uh, as is the case for many of our Latino brothers and sisters in sports journalism, these companies don't know what to do with them uh, unless they're on Univision and Telemundo. And that's no disrespect to Univision and Telemundo, because those outlets are absolutely necessary. But we can also see... Uh, more people of Lat Latino heritage in broader spaces uh, that are Spanish and English speaking. And Dan is one of those people. So I'm definitely very excited to see what he does next and what he does. Yeah, I'd like to see if he does something independent to be. I think that could be huge um, for him. And as you said, I think it's something, you know, I've tried to do as a content creator. We've tried to do this podcast. It's something that I think people should think about following Dan's footsteps is that you can't help other people. You can bring them along. You can't uplift and empower people to put them in positions where they can also create good content um, and empower them to do things even outside of you, you know, going forward. And I think that's definitely part of what uh, Levitar did at ESPN, and I'm sure he'll continue to do that. So, yeah, yeah. Man, salute to him for sure. And I think that I think that one pl one place I don't know where he's going to go. I know Sirius XM, you know, went hard at him a couple years ago before they signed that extension in 2018. I think that was reported even uh, by, you know, uh, probably Richard Dyche because he's all over that stuff or Andrew Marsh and one of them dudes. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I could. But I also think that, like, even if he wants to go independent and he doesn't seem to be somebody who's really moved by money though he was reported in making $3 million salary. So shout out to him. Um, he's going to get a lot of money uh, in terms of his offers. And one place I'm looking at in particular is the ringer because, and we talked about this off mic uh, because, you know, him and Bill Simmons are friends. The ringer seems like a place where they're ambitious. They're trying to do a lot of different things. And now that they're under Spotify and they have a lot of money there, they're trying to, you know, create content in a lot of different ways. And I feel like that's a place where Dan and the show could just be Dan and the show. Stugats could be Stugats. I mean, they're all friends there with Bill Simmons and Bill Simmons will, you know, let them do what they do. And I think uh -huh. that's what they want more than anything else. And also, you know, like just the ringer has, has experimented in a lot of different things they could use a show like that still. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that'll that be big for their platform. But, you know, we'll see. I don't know what it is, but, you know, I'm looking forward to it. These last few weeks of Levitard on ESPN and, you know, January 4th, it's going to be right around the corner. Yeah, we'll see. Like you said, um, I think he definitely needs to be somewhere where he can do his own thing and they understand exactly uh, how to let him do his own thing. That's always important for content creators. All right, this week for me, interesting story. Some of you may have seen this. Some of you may have seen me. Uh, tweet about this story, and it it revolves around this this woman um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, who uh, was chased by a man, black woman uh, living in Lincoln, Nebraska, which can't be easy, was chased <laughs> uh, by a white man uh, in her apartment complex uh, with a chainsaw while yelling multiple racial slurs at her. The woman was 25-year-old Norma Nimox, and uh, she was being dropped off by a sister at the apartment when she was noticed a man standing in the window on the second floor, and uh, she saw that he had a chainsaw in his hand and ripped open the door, and he said some you know vulgar things to her. It's pretty much saying, what's up with the N-word? So not a good situation, and she had to flee from this. Now, there's been this video. This was a, there was a news story done. I want to get the station. It's 1011 now in Lincoln, Nebraska, local news station, who did the reporting on this. And they put out a package on this. And there was a, a story floating around with a, with a woman who 
was appearing to be Norman Nimox in the video, but it was done, and this woman has put this out totally as a parody um, on her Facebook page, and she sort of inserted herself in the package, sort of yeah. reacting the way that she would if she was Norman Nimox in this situation, and listen to some of the stuff she had to say. So I guess when he saw me, he figured I was a soft target. Oh, no, 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 not today. I pulled my gun and put that hot lead up him and put some on his mind that day. He ain't going to be trying to live out his Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre fantasies over here. They better keep his ass in jail because he come back out here. This going to be a horror movie nightmare for his ass. He don't want to come back around here playing with me. So this is what her reaction <laughs> would have been to it and it's hilarious because sometimes you want these characters in these stories right you want these characters in this package but this is a parody the woman you just saw in that video or heard if you're listening to this podcast is not norman nimox okay instead it is tisha essex and shout out to tisha essex one because <laughs> inserting yourself into a news package which is what i do and create for a living multiple times a week you know what I mean? That's not easy. So she had to be creative. She had to know the angle. She shot some B-roll for this. She positioned herself right in the, ca in the camera to make it look like she was being interviewed. I mean, this is dope. And this isn't her first time doing it. She she sent tends to do these stories around incidents of racism. She also did this with a story here in New York in which a white woman threw a bottle at a black woman who was jogging down the street. I believe this was in Queens earlier this summer. And she inserted herself into that too. Now, there's purpose for her doing this, Brian. One is she has her own, she's a former cop, and she did serve in the military, and she's from Cincinnati, Ohio. 25? And, she's already a former cop? Now, I don't know if she's 25. Norma oh. Nimox, the woman was 25. I actually do not know the, oh. I do not know the age. I was going to say, that was, of, a short, that was a short stint. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the age of Tisha Essex, and I apologize, uh, Miss Essex, if I got your name wrong, but she has her own company called Timonex. And it basically is a, you know, it's, it's, she, she sells, um, you know, gun holsters, which she kind of promotes in the story uh, that she puts herself into in Lincoln, Nebraska. She, in her story, just so we're clear, as you heard, she talks about shooting back at the person that came to her with a chainsaw, which a lesson should be learned. Don't bring a chainsaw to a gunfight. You never know what somebody's holding. Um, and so she and so she was ready. And her whole thing is trying to teach people proper self-defense and carrying firearms in the right way. You know, she's, she's not advocating for any horrible gun use, but in the right way. And also, really in terms of black folks protecting themselves against crazy-ass racists out there, which is what could happen. Now, I don't think she's saying that anybody should necessarily have a gun, but I like that she's promoting that people of color in this country that face racism, as the Norman Nimox did in Lincoln, Nebraska, probably need to have ways to protect themselves. Somebody's going to come at you with a chainsaw and yelling racial slurs at you? I, I would like to guess that in that moment, Norman Nimmox wished he had something a little bit stronger or better to do than running away. Now, Norman Nimmox got away and the man was arrested, so she's okay, but what if she hadn't? And that's something fair to think about in this situation, yeah. right? What if she hadn't? What if the woman in Queens who had the bottle thrown at her, things had gone worse? So what I like about what uh, Tisha is doing here, she's bringing awareness to some situations that are obviously ridiculously racist. And she's also, look, she's all in. She's like, look, I'm going to promote my gear, my product in whatever way I can. I'm going to promote my brand in whatever way I can. Yeah. And look, I, I like it. I know it's a parody. She's not doing anything wrong here. And she's teaching people about how to defend themselves properly. So, you know, shout out to Tisha Essex for teaching people to stay ready and being about your brand. I'm, I'm all for that. And, Brian, I figured you'd be about it, too, because we know you like the violence. So, you know, <laughs> she, she, she's, not, she's bringing the violence in a good way about defending yourself, not attacking people with a chainsaw like some crazy yeah. racists out there are doing. So shout out I mean, to Tisha Exes. It's a it's an interesting uh it's an interesting hustle, that's for sure. Word. I mean it's <laughs> Word. just like that's something I like having a line of gun holsters. Which should actually be called Stay Ready. I don't know what they're called, but it should actually be called Stay Ready. I like that. That's, that she she um, she has that's she, a she, fucking she good idea. I've got I should trademark that. Yeah she <laughs> she really it's really concealed carry gear that she has. So it's just like you know, she has like a, a knife holster or like a, you know, gun, a thigh holster or a belly band holster, you know, so she has different things for different products. Um, I get it, man, because look, I mean, look, Lincoln, Nebraska and you're black. I understand. You know what I mean? Shit, if yeah. I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, I would probably be hitting her up because we ain't out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we ain't got a lot of people out there. I mean, look, this this is a testament to also why 
I just don't want to live in rural areas like at any point in my life. I mean, the election is one thing where you sort of look at the graph and it's like, oh, what's blue and what's red? And it's basically like cities are blue, everything else is red. <laughs> like when you look at it, right? No. And, and with me, it's like, I look, there's, there's certain places that I ain't trying to be and that I just don't care to see. Right. right? But, but Miss Essex would say there's certain places that people feel like they have to be in. And when you need to be there, you need to protect yourself. And I do want to read from her website because of, of her tea. She says she was driven by empowering the community and teaching the public to do self-defense. Excuse me. Teaching the public to act as his own first responder, do self-defense, legal and safe gun ownership, building positive personal relationships, medical training, and home defense to become a hard target with a warrior mindset. Now, look, I'm glad she said those things because we've seen people from other groups try to take matters into their own hands, especially when it involves black lives. That hasn't necessarily worked out well. Um, so some people want to be, you know, justice warriors and, and act like they're their own cops. But I do think it's different when uh, you're a minority in this country and you know you can be attacked for the color of your skin, which many people of color have known in this country for hundreds of years. And yeah. I, clearly, that's still not going anywhere. Sadly, I still have to talk about this in one time for your mind where in all seriousness, a woman was attacked by a white man because of the color of her skin. And this white man thought that black people were stealing from him with a chainsaw. Like we're in 2020, and I know that's not really saying much in this year, but we are in 2020 and somebody's still trying to attack somebody for the color of their skin with a chainsaw. Maybe that's a little bit of the reason why Tisha Exodus is like, you got to get defend yourself. You know what I mean? She sounds like she's all, she sounds like she's all about, uh, She's all about that Nas, you know, still mad at, get, got yourself a gun. She's all about that, for sure. Yeah, and in certain places you're going to need that. Look, this story just makes me think about, like, I just hope these vaccines work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I just hope we get to a place where it's like, I, where, where, like, shit could be. Wait, how is, the, how is the vaccine going to stop the racist? Nah, it's not. But I'm saying, look, it's a step in the right direction. I'm just saying, I'm just grasping for straws at this point. First of all, I'm I'm seeing I'm we're talking about this like right shortly after I just hear that Floyd Mayweather's coming back to box and it's not against an actual boxer. It's fucking Logan Paul in February and what's being care. called an exhibition. Floyd Mayweather, who's my size, is gonna fight Logan Paul, who's basically your size. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, anybody, you you want to? Like, you want to see me and me and Brian get in the boxing ring? You want to see that? There's weight classes for a reason. <laughs> we, could, we could pro wrestling. I'm down. You know what I mean? That's nah, a different. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not, what I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not wrestling you. <laughs> not wrestling you, bro. Because because at your height, I know what you I know what you're doing. What you're going for? Nah, man. Nah, yeah, I ain't man. wrestling you. It won't quite be Rey Mysterio, but like you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I I like I've told you before. I think I can be a great professional wrestling manager that's uh, there's a few things that i still have to do in my life and that's one of them that i i really think that independently whatever it is like i can i can i can get a champion out of somebody <laughs> a woman's title a tag team title a men's heavyweight title whatever like See, i really think that that's in me you strike me as somebody who's been waiting for the opportunity to get in the ring and wrestle your entire life you strike me <laughs> as that person <laughs> you know what <laughs> I've been watching wrestling since I was three. He didn't say no. He noticed, folks. He did not say no. I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I'm just going to say I've been watching wrestling since I was three. And look, at some point, some point, you're just like, you know what? Look, I lived by a school at one point, though they, they have now moved. You know what I'm saying? So the temptation for that is gone, and we're in a pandemic. And I don't want to actually wrestle. Like, that lifestyle just is not. Look, there are certain things that I know I'm never going to be able to do. One of them is have a uh, nine to five for a sustainable period of time in terms of just the just the same sort of rigmarole from you know mm -hmm. like you know when you're creative like that shit just is not something that works for you. You need it to be at least a little bit different in some way. Nine to five is different. Nine to five is different than a job. You know what I'm saying? Like I would say you don't have a nine to five. You have a job. It's very different because you're not working the same same nah. hours every nah. day necessarily. It's always changing. So that's different. That's one thing. Two. Uh, Dunk like, basketball. So I've I've never done that on a ten foot <laughs> hoop without help. Yes. However, 
<laughs> However, I'm pretty nice at the nine foot hoop dunks. All right, we used to go to Frontera. Now we're now we're off. Well, like whatever. No, 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 no. Nobody want to hear about you dunking on a nine foot hoop. Yo, I between the legs. Okay. Pump, Stop. That was back then, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nine like foot. Now, we're now. Not, we're not, nine foot hoops. Get get out of here. Man. Elbow in the rim. We used to have dunk contests in Maspin. Yeah. See, I don't know anything about. I don't know anything about that life. I don't know anything about that life. That's short people problems. I don't know anything about that. I need to bring somebody here from back in the day. To oh, just we do. Tell, oh, to we just do. Tell story. I don't know. Preferably, who preferably, me. preferably, as we wrap this up, preferably somebody from back in the day that has also accompanied, accompanied you to Uba Duba. That is the perfect person to come on the podcast. We need that person. Thankfully, I'm still very close with my best friend from middle school who lives in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, he's, he's seen every level of what you see today. You know, he's seen the sort of transformation Ooh. from, Ooh. That look, is, man, that I is... was wearing, ba- I was wearing baggy clothes in 2014 and switched that up. You know what I'm Ooh. saying? Like that is, that is a whole nother podcast on a whole nother topic that needs to be addressed. All right, y'all, but, uh, we'll see. Before we go, I just yes. want to mention this real quick before we go, uh, Errol Spence beat the shit out of Danny Garcia yesterday. And as good as Danny Garcia had been, um, you know, as good as I thought he was going to be last night, he was not. And Errol Spence beat the shit out of him. All I'm going to say about that fight is that Errol Spence needs to fight Terrence Crawford next. Top rank PBC, make it happen. I don't want to hear nothing else. I'm, That's I, I'm agreeing with that. And I don't want to hear anybody talk about this damn Mayweather fight against <laughs> wh- whatever his name Paul is. You guys, if you guys could support that. Seriously, seriously, we can do better. We can do better. We got we got Triple G, Felix Verdejo, and Canelo Alvarez all fighting this weekend. Nice. So there's been some interesting times with boxing. Yeah, uh, Spence looked dominant. I don't really have anything else to say about that. Remember, everybody stay always stay ready. Be ready. Um, a lot of things you got to worry about out there. And uh, we hope we're very excited to see what Dan Lebertard will do with his next opportunity. That's it. For this episode of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, episode 158. Special thanks to our guest on this podcast, uh, the great Static Selector, for joining sure. us. Huge guest. We're going to try to get more uh, people involved in hip hop and music down the road. That is something Brian and I have been working on. So we're very glad and, uh, to get Static on the podcast. Uh, huge shout out and thank you to Mass Appeal for connecting with us and making that happen. We really, truly appreciate that uh, and look forward to doing more work with them down the road. Um, Please continue to support us in the ways that you have. Subscribe to the podcast or whatever listening, streaming platform that you do. Uh, Continue to support us via Patreon. And check out all the other great stuff that we have via Backpack Broadcasting. For episode 158 of the Hang Out to Tell podcast, I'm Dexter Henry. He's Brian Fonseca. Always ready to wrestle. And until next time, y'all, peace.